Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom, an immersive sports business training and educational experience dedicated to preparing future sports business professionals. It is a one of a kind learning opportunity for those interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. Great academics, hands-on experience, immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. For more information about Sports Business Classroom, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. Today's guest is the great Bo Estes, also known as the Goat Mentator. Bo is a host and columnist for Turner Sports and is most recognized for his work on NBA.com and NBA TV. If you've ever watched NBA.com's top 10 highlights, you're familiar with Bo's work. Bo is amazingly talented incredibly knowledgeable and in this episode he drops a ton of useful knowledge and actionable advice in this episode we discuss taking risks finding your voice and what it's like to achieve your dreams ladies and gentlemen this was a really special episode for me Bo is so much fun and i learned so much from him i really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as i did without further ado i give you Bo Essies. Well, Bo, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, Sergio. I, I've uh, been listening and, and really been impressed with what I've heard so far, and so I'm excited to be a part of it. I really appreciate that. Uh, I thought we'd start off with the fact that I, I read somewhere that you said that you told your parents you wanted to be a sportscaster when you were just five years old. Is that true? I was- I was in a living room in Southern California. I grew up living in Mission Viejo, and I told my parents, and my parents both remember it very clearly, I want to be a sportscaster. Uh, And Sergio, I I can tell you from that, I never, ever veered from that dream. I'm 48 years old now, so it's 43 years down the road, and I never, ever diverted from it. I didn't go to a guidance counselor in high school or college. I took the exact classes that would lead me to where I am today. So, um, you know, you know, it's, it's, I look at it two ways humorously. One, I achieved the dream that I really, really wanted to go for in a very specific way. Uh, the other side of it is I, I'm living out the dream of a five-year-old. So, you know, you t- <laughs> take it either way you want to, but it, it, I did, I did land where I wanted to land when I was five years old. That's fantastic. And I wanted, I want to talk about your career path, but what, what sports did you like growing up? Uh, honestly, uh, I was, like I mentioned, I was in Mission Viejo, and when Magic Johnson came to the Los Angeles Lakers uh, and won that title in his rookie year, I became an NBA fan in my heart. That was always the place I wanted to be involved. I, I remember to this day, Magic Johnson, they, they had a, there, there was this song called, Do You Believe in Magic? Mm-hmm. And they had this montage of all these great Magic Johnson plays after the Lakers won the title and it just hit me as a little kid. Uh, so yeah, the NBA was my big thing. I was a better soccer player as a kid. I was, I was a good soccer player. I, I was, good enough to make the high school basketball team uh but i was not i was not an excellent basketball player i but i loved it i always loved it and so basketball was always my passion so you knew from a very early age you wanted to be a broadcaster you loved basketball what uh, what steps did you take to to head in that direction so uh, when I got to high school, uh, the first thing I did was join the newspaper staff. I knew that that was the closest thing we had to uh, being a broadcaster was learning to write, learning to write scripts. And, and quickly, I became the sports editor of our, our, our newspaper staff in high school. Um, from there to college, uh, I was I was the, the sports editor of our newspaper staff there. Uh, in between that, there was there was a local 
cable station that allowed young people to broadcast high school games. So I was a play-by-play voice for high school games at 17 years old, and it was recorded on an old Radio Shack mic, and there was like a camera that was locked down. That, that That's all that you got of the game, but you got something, and it was reps, honestly. And so everything I did, I poured in to becoming a sportscaster. Um, to, honestly, to the detriment of my other studies, because I was so focused on this. But, um, you know, the thing that I think you can take away from this is I identified a goal very early on Mm -hmm. uh, and I directed my behavior. I directed my actions so that I could be successful at that specific goal. I don't know, Sergio, that everybody is that you know, goal oriented at such a young age or has that dream at such a young age. But if you do, then you have an advantage because you can take the steps that lead to success, that create a path uh, to get you where you want to go. And and I I did that uh, at least in, in fairness, there's a lot of luck involved. There's a whole lot of luck, but I did take the steps necessary to give myself a chance. And were your parents always supportive of what you wanted to do? 100%. Um, I think, uh, you you know, they they always thought that much like you would hear an NBA player's uh, parents say, have a backup plan. What else could you do? Because becoming a becoming a sportscaster. And by the time I was in high school, I wanted to be an NBA broadcaster is is a long shot. You know, the the odds aren't great. It's, it's really not. You know, you, if you if you work really hard, you give yourself a chance at it. But have another plan. So they they had that in mind. Uh, I don't know that that successfully got through to me because I, I really I had nothing else. I was laying it all on the line. Uh, to becoming an NBA uh, broadcaster. But, you know, I think that my parents saw that as a passion of mine. And one thing that I think that, that's great that parents can do is is if you support your, your child's passion, if they show an interest, if they show a long-term continued interest, support it. And my parents definitely did do that. So I, I realize I was lucky in that regard. Credit to mom and dad. Oh, a hundred percent. They, and look, my parents split up, but they were on the same team as far as getting me to where I wanted to go. Uh, and you know, again, you talk about advantages. I, I, you know, my first two years of college, they helped pay for, I paid for my last two years of college. So, you know, there were advantages along the way, uh, for sure. But, uh, everybody seemed to be on board and the closer I got to the goal, the more everybody really is sort of the momentum built. Sure. No, I can imagine. And uh, I want to get back to something you said related to just knowing where you want to go is so highly underrated, right? Like you said, if you know what you're going to do or what you want to do and what your passion is, you are at such a huge advantage. And that's one of the common themes with all the guests that have been on the show is that a lot of them were super clear on wanting to be in sports and the exact job they wanted, right? And so if you know what your North Star is, the uh, the steps that you need to take in order to get there become so much more clear. I think that's true. And I think the one thing that, that you'll find is people that identify a passion, not just a goal, but for me, it was a passion. I loved it. I love being in that moment when, when the lights would come on three, two, one, you're on bow. I loved that moment. So, uh, I think, you know, if you have a passion, maybe you work a little bit harder, maybe you're more motivated to go towards that goal. So one thing I would encourage people to do, especially if you're young, especially if you've got all your shots still available to you is is go towards your passion find your passion go towards it work as hard as you possibly can that's one thing that i have seen over and over and over again in my career is is that you know whatever you lack in talent perhaps or in skill you can you can backfill with hard work you can really really outwork somebody and and make a name for yourself that way too so I, i think you know finding your passion identify that passion and going towards it is is a real key for my success and I, I've seen it in others too so I'm, I'm curious when you were young were you uh, were you the guy sitting in front of the TV with a recorder <laughs> you know doing play-by-play with the volume down or what I mean were you practicing at a young age or what what were you doing to prepare yourself 
Yes. Uh, it, it, weirdly, I, I was the guy who not only did that, but as I as I told you, I was a, a bench player. Uh, I made the varsity basketball team in my sophomore year, but I was on the bench. But I would be commentating on the bench. And it, it, to tell you a funny story, I, I was so passionate about basketball that, that I would lose myself in the game and, and almost lose my team allegiance. We, <laughs> when, when I was a kid in the 80s, dunking was everything, Sergio. If you could dunk it was the world and so we played a team called North Springs early in the season and this kid uh, got a steal from us and ran down the court and just hammered a dunk on us and I jumped up off the bench and was cheering like crazy for this kid on the other team <laughs> my whole team turns around and looks at me and my coach as politely as he could told me to shut up and sit down and anybody that was on that bench will remember that that forever because I was I was a basketball fan. I'm a highlights guy and yeah. I was excited to see a, humong, a humongous dunk. It was my passion. I couldn't help it. That's amazing. Now, did you know you were good at a young age? Did you know you had a voice for this kind of thing? Or when did you realize I, we know that you wanted you knew that you wanted to do this? When did you start to realize that you were pretty you were pretty good at it? I think I knew I was a good writer before I knew I was a good broadcaster. I think I knew at a young age I could really write and put a story together. Uh, and that's a different skill. It's related to broadcasting, but it's a different skill. Uh, so I think combining that with broadcasting came later. Uh, honestly, my senior thesis in college, I was so impacted by, you know, those sports center anchors in the 90s who would have a little bit of fun in the, in the sports people like Craig Kilborn and guys like that that would make it a show that my senior thesis was how can a sports broadcaster incorporate his personality into his broadcast Wow! Uh, and so my my thought was and, and what I took away from this and my discovery was you have to develop credibility first you have to be solid you have to have the facts and you have to demonstrate that over and over and over again through time and then your personality can come out. And I found that senior thesis I did in college became very true of my career. I was I was pretty straight as a broadcaster when I was young. The first time I ever had a camera pointed at me uh, was for GPTV, it's Georgia Public Television. And I was going to do a high school football story. So the night before I did this story, I wrote what's called your standup. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So I wrote the part that I would be on camera and explaining it, and I practiced it a thousand times. I had it down. I could have said it backwards. I could have said it forwards. I could have said it any way you want to say. So we get out there to the field, and I, I get lined up for my stand-up, and he points the camera, three, two, one, go, and I just, I just buzz off like a typewriter every single word. <laughs> it was perfect. I dropped the mic, walked away. Yeah. And in looking back on it, I was very robotic. I was very, I was very, very, very much, uh, you know, stiff, uh, but I nailed it. And so in my mind, I did my job. I think through time and seasoning, you learn how to become looser, to tell the story, to let the audience understand the story versus just spitting out the words like a computer might do. So that's a process for me, but the writing always came very naturally. And so you said you did your first uh, your first broadcast between high school and college. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So sort of the uh, play by play for uh, Gwinnett County is a suburb county of Atlanta. And so I was on Gwinnett County Cable Vision doing uh, their games with. Uh, and I'm not kidding. The, the microphone was no bigger than a ballpoint pin. And <laughs> I was kneeling down in a press press box doing play by play for these games. And so what happened? So you went to what, what university did you go to? What school did you go to? So it was a circuitous path. I started out at Reinhardt, which is uh, 45 minutes north of Atlanta. It was a junior college then. Then I went to Athens for a year. But if you remember, in in Georgia at that time, uh, the Olympics were coming, mm -hmm. uh, the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. So they wanted all of us. We were in something called the Hope Broadcast Training Program. So all of us students came to either Kennesaw, Georgia, 
Georgia State or Clark Atlanta. I, I went to Kennesaw State University, and then we all finished up at Clark Atlanta University to get our certificate to be involved in the whole broadcast training program. So that's where we all ended up. And then, you know, my first – Geez, my first month out of college, I'm working the 1996 Olympics, and it was a thrill. Wow. How did you get hooked up with that? Well, it was one of those things where if you were involved in broadcasting uh, in Georgia at the time, you all became aware of this Hope Broadcast Training Program. And like I said, I was always on top of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I jumped on that opportunity, got accepted into the program. And look, when I came out of college, I wasn't, you know, they didn't have me on air at the Olympics. I was a production assistant. I was logging notes at, you know, table tennis or fencing. But the one cool thing that we had we had what was called an infinity pass. Uh, so that allowed us when we were off work to get behind the scenes and get into every single event. So I saw Carl Lewis win gold in Atlanta. I saw Michael Johnson with the gold shoes in Atlanta. We saw uh, the dream team two in Atlanta. It was funny because we went to a press conference and David Robinson and Grant Hill were uh, up there waiting to be interviewed and nobody is asking any questions of David Robinson and Grant Hill. So so me and a buddy of mine who had just got out of college, we're asking all the questions in the interview, even though we don't have a story to file. Right. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in there taking, in. exactly. We're taking advantage of every single opportunity we can get. And, and look, you know, that wasn't necessarily career directed. It was, but it was also, it was just a great joy to be able to do. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun at the 1996 Olympics, but it was also, uh, you know, it was a career building opportunity. No question. So where where'd your career lead you after that? So what, uh, lots of things were going on at the same time. Uh, okay. So uh, I was... Uh I was a student and I was just getting ready to graduate. But a couple of years earlier, during my while in my major, our school took us on a tour of GPTV. And one thing, and, I, and if I can just really stress this, I, I found that hard work is is a common thread through my career and so many other careers. But I we took a tour through GPTV. They had the show called Prep Sports Plus, mm -hmm. and I was watching a taping of it, and I just took it upon myself to start helping out with the production. These tapes need to be moved over here. I'll do that. I'll take care of that even while we're on our tour. And so this, this, this producer of this show noticed me. Uh, it turns out that producer's name is John Dahl and he's one of the biggest names in sports production today. He's the guy who came up with the ESPN 30 for 30 project, all that sports century stuff that you think of. Uh, but at the time he was a producer for CNN sports. So way back when, while in college, I got an intern at CNN Sports that led quickly to a freelance job at Turner Sports. So that's how I got my start there. Okay. So as, as the Olympics wind down, I'm already in at Turner Sports and I'm working on inside the NBA as it was back then. Uh, I'm, I'm what, what was called a logger or a highlight editor or highlight producer. And so I'm already doing those jobs. So I naturally just transitioned into more of a full-time role at Turner Sports that fall and got a job uh, with Turner Sports covering the 1998 Olympics, where we went to Nagano, Japan, and then from there uh, covered the 1998 Goodwill Games in New York. So it was all sort of working at the same time. You created your own luck. Well, yeah. I, and again, that's that's why I said, look, I, I talk about hard work and it's it, it's not just talk. It's it's a real thing. And, and I'll give you an example that you won't even know, but but it relates to you guys. When I, I, I took a job, as you know, with uh, Sports Business Classroom mm -hmm. uh, and I was the new guy. I, I was the I guess you call it the broadcasting chair for the that school. And I arrived at the Thomas and Mack Center. Uh, and what happened was that my credential wasn't handy. It wasn't there. So what happens? You, Sergio, didn't just say to someone, hey, get Bo his credential. It was you that took me all around and found that credential. Mm -hmm. From there, I go up and I'm waiting in what was the, I believe it was the hall pass booth. And I look down and, you know, it, I don't know if it was that day or later that day, but I see Warren Legary, when nobody's looking around at him, he's picking up papers on the floor and cleaning up. And it just hit me. This is hard work from everybody at every level. And it's a common thread for success. 
Everybody that's succeeding is doing that same thing, is putting forth that effort. And it happens when people aren't looking. You need to be doing it all the time. You know, people will notice it, but even when people aren't looking, if you can make that a part of your character, you'll move forward. Absolutely. And like I said, you, you know, you're, I love your story because you created your own luck. You created your own opportunities and you were, you were there at the right time in front of the right people. And that's what, you know, led you on the path that you were on today. And the truth of the matter is every single person I've talked to has the same story, right? They got involved in as many things as they possibly could. They busted their butt for the right people and eventually somebody takes notice and the truth of the matter is i think in sports more so than any other industry that's how you get in that's i mean that's how you get in you need to impress the right people before they're going to give you a job and the only way to do that is by showing them what you got and many times you're going to have to do that for free and that's okay but if you have the right stuff and you and and you do the things that you need to do and you're reliable and you've got the passion, like you said, good things happen. And I think I think what's really true also is one of the things that I've done is is tried to make if I feel like I have a deficit in an area, like I pointed out, I was the new guy at sports business classroom. I my approach the whole time was, well, how do I make up for not having the experience? Well, maybe if I work a little harder, maybe if I prepare myself a little more then some of the things that I may not know about, I'll have an answer to in advance of that. So, I, again, it's when people aren't looking that you need to be working hard as well. And and like you said, if everybody that's coming on this show is saying that same thing, I think I think people can take something from that, that you can take advantage. And it's something that everybody can do. It's not a special skill. I remember, you know, competing for jobs with people who had degrees from Yale and stuff like that. I didn't have a degree from Yale. I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I didn't have that sort of a background. But what I did was work hard. I was always there. I was always willing to do something extra. And it worked out for me in the end. And and so that gives you at least a chance when you're in that room to succeed. No question. So I want to get back to Turner. So talk a little bit about what you do at Turner now and the different jobs that you've held while being there. Okay, so what I do now, um, I think most notably people know me for uh, the NBA.com highlights, particularly those top tens that have gone viral for years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a small part of what I do. Uh, I call all the highlights that you hear on NBA.com. So what that means is every night I'm watching NBA games, I'm getting the highlights, I'm calling them and sending back audio files. Uh, Also, we have a a podcast, a daily wrap-up podcast called The Fast Break that is on Amazon and is available in several other spots. That's like a five minute wrap up of what happened in the NBA that day. I do that. We have something called the heads up play of the day. It's an analysis thing where I break down a play from the NBA that we found particularly relevant. So that's my NBA.com job. I'm also a host on NBA TV for afternoon updates. You can see me on television from time to time on NBA TV. I was, uh, I was the host uh, when the NBA was in China, uh, uh, this fall and and we were going through all those stories I was the host on air for that which had me waking up at three in the morning which was a challenge to be ready and and really sharp for those broadcasts um also, I, I work for NCAA.com, so I do the highlights for the NCAA occasionally I'll do I'll host a show if they have a show there um so yeah, that's my role at Turner Sports now. It's not always been that way. I've hosted uh, PGA.com shows. I've hosted, um, geez, we had NASCAR property for years and years, and I was the main host for NASCAR. Um, before that, I was I was a producer. I was an associate producer. Uh, basically, I was our feature guy, and that goes back to my writing skill. I could I could really write a story. So they had me as a feature producer, and I would go out and interview uh, different athletes all over the place we were up in Canada interviewing Steve Nash's high school coaches I've been you know geez around the world doing this job uh so that led into my broadcasting but what you know early on at Turner while I was doing that producing I was also hosting a show on CBS uh that was a high school sports show so I was on camera there developing my skills and those repetitions and the fact that I got noticed doing that allowed me to get an audition 
at Turner Sports uh, to host the Braves show. Uh, the you know so every Atlanta Braves game that was on TBS, you would have a um, studio host, and that studio host, the two people that had that job were myself and somebody you may have heard of, Aaron Andrews, who mm-hmm. went on to do quite well for herself as well. Yep. Uh, so so yeah, that's that's how it all sort of started out, and that's how uh, I've I've grown through the Turner Sports ranks. Incredible. So, let, I mean, it sounds like you like to keep busy. What sure. uh, can you walk me through just a day in the life? What does what a day in the life look like for you? I've heard I've heard on another interview that you did that it's not uncommon for you to have to pull over on the side of the freeway to go to narrate a piece. <laughs> I mean, just if you could, what time do you wake up? Um, you know, do you have any morning rituals? Like when you get to work, just if you could break that all down, that'd be great. No, okay, so as you might imagine, NBA games happen in the evening and I'm on the East Coast, so my schedule is sort of that of a vampire. Yeah. Um, waking up is is not really, uh, you know, I wake up when I wake up. But when I wake up, I'm the first thing I do is I'm studying to see if there's any breaking news in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any important stories? What are my games that night? And I read a preview of every game. Um, from there, my night starts probably at about 7 o'clock when a producer sends me uh, basically a plan for the evening. What we'll do is we'll we'll discuss what we want to talk about on the Fast Break Wrap-Up pro- podcast, uh, and then uh, I'll get my game assignments. Uh, I watch basketball from there. I share on social media because I'm, I'm finding social media to just be such a growing and valuable resource. I'm, I'm sure you've noticed that as well. Sure. But, I, you know, and then when the highlights hit, I'm really jamming. So my, my heavy workload is from 10 p.m to 2 a.m. my time. Now, you know, if, if you followed along socially, you'll note that I've picked up a new job. I'm the announcer for uh, the NBL's top 10 as well. So that's the Australian Basketball League. I'm I'm their voice too now. Uh, so I will probably at 2 a.m. when I wrap up, we'll watch an Illawarra game against Sydney or something like that so I can see LaMelo Ball play. Uh, I won't get to bed till four in the morning uh, and then the circle starts all over again. I saw Kristen Ledlow send out a tweet uh, the other day saying that she wakes up at noon. I know the feeling because you end up staying up so, so late. But then, um, you know, I find it important to get some sort of sort of, um, you know, get away from social media every day, whether it's take a walk, whether it's exercise, whether it's listen to a podcast that's completely different from basketball, Mm -hmm. Um, just to clear your mind. It also allows me, I think it allows me to be more creative because if you get stuck in such a tight space, I I, I don't think you're pushing your boundaries enough. Uh, So I I listen to different podcasts, entertainment podcasts, uh, all sorts of stuff just to keep my mind fresh. Yeah. What are, what are your passions outside of basketball? Um, I, I like to travel for sure. Um, we, we spent, we lived in Hawaii for a little over a month. I say lived in, I guess that, that may be overstating, but we were in Maui for quite a while. We rented an apartment there and, and really loved that. We're going to Europe for a couple of weeks soon. Uh, I wrote a book, uh, that's not been released yet, but I guess at some point I will have to release it, uh, on, on a travel experience in Alaska that we took several weeks up there. And so I, I think writing, uh, and traveling, uh, my wife's a photographer. She's a producer at CNN as well, but she's a photographer. So we sort of combine all of that stuff. Uh, and, and that really fills up my outside time. It's interesting because I found myself listening to and reading more and more of, of almost like an outdoors life podcast, like Appalachian Trail hiking and stuff like that. I've never hiked a day in my life, but I find <laughs> it enjoyable to listen to those experiences. And, you know, the, the way I the way I rationalize it is, you know, I'm never going to go to the moon, but I could sure listen to astronauts talk about space travel. It's the same way I feel about this stuff. It's, it's very relaxing. It's very um, mind expanding. It's, it's just a different way of looking at the world and spending your time. No question. I'd say the same thing about books. I mean, I'm a big, uh, I, I love to read. And the truth of the matter is when you read books, you get to learn from the experiences of people who came before you. Right. I mean, there's no reason to uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel and you don't need to learn everything by yourself. You can certainly spend time reading books and learning from great people who came before you. 
Yeah, I think books are critical. I, I read, I, I certainly don't read as much as you, but I, I read several books. I've read three or four this month. Uh, and, you know, in, in preparing for our trip to Europe, we're reading more more stuff that is, you know, a novel based in Paris, uh, a travel log across Europe, stuff like that. I'm, I'm reading that sort of thing. But I, I just feel like it makes you a, a more well-rounded person. And I also think it makes, I think it makes me a better broadcaster, frankly. I really think what I read there, you know, breaks down some barriers and makes me more creative, particularly in those top tens that that people are so fond of. Yes. And that's a perfect segue that I definitely wanted to get back to NBA.com top 10. What, what goes into the process of producing the highlights for the day? Um, so basically there is one person that is assigned to doing the top 10. This producer, he or she, uh, and I work together. I don't ever create the rankings, but I certainly suggest plays. Uh, and what I do is I send out, uh, a message on, on Twitter, send me your nominees for the top 10. I send each of those to the producer. And then at the end of the night, when the last game ends, they send me what is is the top 10 that night. I have about 10 minutes to turn that around into whatever crazy creation I can come up with. And it surely has evolved over the years from more of a, a straightforward broadcast to what my senior thesis in college was all about. How do you inject your personality? I've, I've definitely injected my personality at this point, yeah. but uh, I think, I think, you know, it's the thing is the NBA top 10, it's such a quick turnaround. People wouldn't believe how fast we turn Turn those around. There's not a lot of time to write and you know really produce it up, uh, but it's it's also one of those things where you have to understand at the end of the night, say the Clippers and Lakers are playing. Well, that game starts at 10:30 and it ends at 12:45 my time. At 12:45, I get the top 10. I have to do the fast break podcast wrap up. I have to do the heads up play of the day, and I I have to do the highlight that's eventually coming in. And we all want we want all that done in 30 minutes. So it's a mad rush mm-hmm. um, to get stuff done. And and maybe that man energy, Sergio. Maybe that's what comes out more than anything. I mean, I I certainly know when the top 10 changed for me, uh, I can trace it to a single day, but I, I, you know, I, it went viral, uh, the, you know, dead spin picked it up when I did the tribute to David Bowie on the day that he passed away, mm-hmm. when I did the tribute to George Michael on the day that he passed away. Uh, but it's, it's just, honestly, it's become the thing I've been, uh, I, I'm known for. I'm comfortable with that, but I never went in with that as an objective. Yeah, so you write all your own scripts, correct? Uh, what is written is written 100% by me. Nobody has ever written a single line for me uh, that is not for me. A lot of it is ad lib. So if you go back to the preseason and look at every top 10 I did this year, every one of those is ad libbed. Wow. I didn't write a single line. Most of what happens on a top 10 is I will have one thing I want to get to, one thing I want to say for each play. And then, but it's usually two or three lines. So it's the one line and then two or three supplemental lines that are ad libbed and I just roll through it. And it's just, it's, it's like any other job in the world. That's the best way I can explain it. Once you've done it for a long time and you get confidence and you've, you've worked that muscle, it just becomes natural and you just flow and go and go. And that's, that's where I am now on it. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that it's touched people, uh, that people seem to enjoy it. I, I also get a kick out of the negative comments as well, maybe more than the positive comments. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, when I get a message from a kid that's in Africa or someone from the Philippines or somebody in New Zealand or in Asia, I, when I, if you would have told 14 year old Bo that this would have happened, I, my mind would have just been blown. It's, it's, it's beyond anything I could have ever hoped for or imagined, but it is a dream come true. Now, were you always good at rhyming? Like, is that a skill you've always had? I mean, you did just say that, you know, you've gotten better at it over time, but was this something that you could do at a young age? 
it's funny because there's this there's this well respected uh, literary magazine called the Kenyan Literary Review. They did a review of my top tens, and they, the the writer of that review suggested that I suffer from a condition called clanging, which means that in my mind everything is rhyming, and so it, to break out of that would be my bigger challenge. And I don't know; I've never been diagnosed with that. I don't know if that's true, but it could be because things do sort of flow for me. Um, and, you know, it, it just works out that way. It, you know, and it's easy for me to see the rhyme it, it, in my head, just so people at home know what I'm saying coming out of my mouth. I'm thinking two lines ahead. I'm in my mind. I'm two lines ahead as the words are coming out of my mouth. Wow. So that's just the way it works. And I, I don't know how else to explain it uh, other than it just it just works for me. Uh, and it's one of those things you whether you call it a, a disability like clanging or, <laughs> or, or or something that really worked out. Uh, it's there and I, I can call upon it and I can make it work. Now, is this something that you've always experienced or is this something that's developed over time as far as being two, uh, you know, two sentences ahead? I'm certainly better at it now. There's no question that I'm better at it now than I used to be. And there are just like any other job. There are nights where I'm really on and there are nights where I think I'm never going to get through this. That's that's the truth of the matter. There are nights where I feel like they could substitute a new play in on me live and I could make up something and just nail it. <laughs> uh, but if you, if you think about it, I have probably called more NBA highlights than just about anybody alive. I don't know anybody. I mean, Ernie Johnson, maybe, but he, he does it once a week now. Uh, so I, I call so many of these highlights. So I know the names and there, there's patterns that develop in your head. So I, I just think it, it, it works out for me that way. But I, I'll tell you, the day that everything changed for me was May 1st, 2014. Uh, I did a top five that day uh, and I walked out of the booth uh, down at Turner Sports and producers were giving me high fives and people were like clapping and it's sort of one of those funny they're laughing at you while they're also cheering it at the same time it wasn't you know it certainly wasn't you know Paul McCartney giving a concert or anything like that but it's just your buddies laughing and cheering you on but I remember the response to that top five and I remember uh, really nailing it and thinking we may be on to something and then the NBA Reddit viral thing Thing happened not too long after that where people started talking about how quickly I said top 10 at the end mm -hmm. uh, and it's just taken off from there if you, if you go to our YouTube page and look at the views we get on a daily basis it's five six seven hundred thousand views in 24 hours and nothing else we do comes even remotely close to that so the top 10's just become an absolute monster and, and you know I couldn't be more grateful to the people who who watch it and listen to it yeah, I mean, collectively, just the, the number of views those videos have seen, it's just the numbers are astronomical. I mean, how do yes. you wrap your head around that even? No, you can't. That's the that's the point is I can't wrap my head around it. Uh, and, you know, to take it back to Summer League, I don't. So my job means that I'm in the studio a lot. I don't go to a ton of NBA games. Mm -hmm. And when I was in that arena and people were coming up and, and shaking my hand and saying they enjoyed the top fives and top tens that I did, it, it I guess it really hit me then that it's it's impacting people. And I knew it a little bit, but when somebody comes up to you in person and says that to you and really uh, smiling and wanting to take a picture with you, it hits you and, and you're really grateful for it. Look, uh, you know, I'm not Ernie Johnson. I'm not I'm not those guys. That, that's that's the best broadcaster I know in the world. But I found a niche and I'm, I'm really working hard to make sure people continue to enjoy that. And they most certainly do. I hope so. I, I want to move on to this year, like as we alluded to earlier, was the first year you invo you were involved in sports business classroom. Talk a little bit about your role and some of the, the things you experienced and being part of the leadership of the program. Well, it's interesting because, uh, as you know, Larry Kuhn was my boss. Larry Kuhn heads up the program. And Larry uh, talked to me about joining. And, and initially I said, Larry, I would love to, but I don't know that I'm the best choice for this. I'm, I'm not a college professor. I've never been a college professor. I don't know anything about it. And he said, just trust me and follow me. Use your experience and, and you'll be fine. And I will tell you, uh, 
as as is often the case, Larry Coon was right. Uh, I I found myself really wanting to give these students uh, the experience that I have in television, the opportunities that I have in television and broadcasting more generally. So. Um, what we tried to do was we tried to uh, give them several different pieces. Um, we took them on tours through ESPN Live Trucks. They got to talk to directors and producers as the show was going on. Um, and then I gave them an opportunity to actually be a part of a live NBA Summer League broadcast. They were on NBA Sound System. Some of these students wow. doing an analysis with uh, Jimmy Cook, a play-by-play announcer you know who does a wonderful job. Uh, so Jimmy would, would sort of guide them through and they would be a part of a broadcast. Uh, so that was another aspect that I wanted to give them. In fact, a couple of them got to work with Mark Jones, the ESPN broadcaster. Uh, from there, we also got to do a little bit with, um, you know, the NBA's podcasting where you got to do like a day wrap up. So the thing I really wanted to, to impress upon these students was there are so many more opportunities now than when I came up. There are so many more avenues to explore. So if media is your interest, let's take you down several of these paths and see what interests you. And if if you want to pursue it, I want to help. And, and the one thing that has really been great for me is I have a continuing relationship with so many of these students now to this day. Uh, not a day goes by where I don't get a text or a call from one of them and we talk about what they're doing and how I can help them move forward, uh, how their goals are being reached, uh, you know, their frustrations, what can they do better. Um you know, like I said, when I was a kid, I had a dream to be an NBA sportscaster, and it has been laser focused. Uh, but one of the things that I've been confronted with in my life is what happens when you very specifically achieve your dreams like I've done? I very specifically achieved what I wanted to do. So what next? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this sports business classroom has been a wonderful answer to that question. Uh, I, I found that I want to help young people people achieve their dreams? Uh, how can I open up doors? How can I, uh, you know, give them a ladder up? Uh, it, it, it's something that means a whole lot to me now. Well, for one, I, I do want to mention that that was going to be one of the questions I was going to ask is what happens when you achieve your, the dream you've had since you were four years old, like what happens next? But have you always known that you wanted to teach and mentor? Is that something that you figured out recently? No, I did not know that. I, I really didn't. It's like you said, I, you may do a thousand episodes of this show and you'll never find somebody who so specifically achieved a five-year-old's dream. Uh, and and, and there's, there's pros and cons to that. So I, I, at some point a few years ago, I realized I've got to do something else. I've got to expand my horizons. And I started coaching my nephew's basketball team and I got a lot out of that. Uh, you know, just trying to impact young people in that way. And, and it was fun because, you know, we had the access, so we would take them down after every season and they, they'd get to meet Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley mm -hmm. and go into the studio. So you could see their faces light up and it, it's just a thrill that was. But this sports business classroom really took the, that idea of helping younger people and not always younger people, people who wanted to change careers later in life, helping them achieve those goals, at least uh, mentoring them, guiding them. I'm not always going to have all the answers, but I'm going to work hard to get the answers for these people. And I, I tell students that a lot, you know, what, sh you know, people ask me technically, what equipment should I use? I don't necessarily know the answer, but I can get it to you from a Turner technician. So all that stuff is, is meaningful to to me in a different way than the sports casting because like I said I have achieved the dream I did it I, I really did so now what next you've got to do something else with your life right and I think that's a common theme a lot of uh, amongst a lot of the the great people in sports is that once they do achieve their dreams you know so many people have uh, you know extended their arms out especially for sports business classroom and try and help the youth of tomorrow Right. And, and, and quite frankly, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is because several years ago, I came to the realization that, you know, I love to learn, but I also love to teach and I love to mentor and I love to help people get to where they want to go with whatever advice that I can provide them. And, 
you know, as I've told you before, you know, it's, it's somewhat outside of my comfort zone to be on the mic or in front of the camera. That's not who I am. I've always been the behind the scenes guy, but I knew that by being a part of this podcast and by creating this podcast that I could help impact people and that could help get people to where they wanted to go. So I'm totally with you as far as, you know, how satisfying that feeling is. Well, and I think one thing, whether it's how you've achieved your dreams or how I've achieved my dreams, is one thing you have to have is sort of the courage to take the chance at it, mm-hmm. the courage to to be a to 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 fail, really, because I t- I took a swing at my dream and I I really could have failed, uh, but it, that courage is a characteristic. It's a characteristic uh, you have inside you, and it can it can grow, it can shrink, but to go and do something else, to try to push another button. To step outside of your comfort zone you have to have the courage to do that and i think on a podcast like this not only you know do you get a chance to to you know offer advice and teach and stuff like that your awareness and my awareness and everybody's awareness can grow from the exchanges that you and I have, the exchanges you have with other guests and, and ideas grow upon conversations. I found that all the time. We have ideas meetings at Turner for features. And what is the first idea is often very different from the final idea, but it starts with one thought and it grows from there. And again, even in those ideas meetings, somebody has to have the courage to step up in front of everybody and say, this is what I think would be a good idea and, and risk getting shunned by their peers. But you got to have that courage to do it. You must have the courage to do it. There's a, a great quote by Teddy Roosevelt that I have posted in my office that talks about being the man in the arena. And it's one that I came across recently while reading the book Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, which is a great book, by the way. Um, but it goes like this. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knows victory nor defeat. We've all been scared of something or of taking some sort of leap. It's, it's natural. It's part of being a human being. But to become who you're destined to be, you have to step outside of your comfort zone and you just have to take risks. It's outside of your comfort zone where all the magic happens. It truly is. And if you don't take risks, you'll never know what the possibilities are or what could have happened. You just won't. I will tell you my favorite quote, uh, and it's it's in the same vein. It's my favorite quote in my life. It's John Greenleaf Whittier, and it goes just like this. Of all the sad words of tongue or of pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. What that means is if you didn't take the chance, it's the saddest choice you could make. You have to take the chance or you'll never know if you could make it. That is a critical key aspect to life, I think. I just think everybody, if you take anything from this, take chances. Strive for your dreams. Go for it. Really lay it out there. You really need to. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's impactful stuff. I have a few audience questions if you have some time. Oh, of course. Uh, One of the questions was related to, you know, what's it like having achieved your four-year-old dream and and what happens after that? But the follow-up was, so how do you keep finding new challenges so that you can keep raising your game? How do you continue to stay sharp? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's it's taking those chances, you know, taking the chance like I did with Sports Business Classroom helped me stay sharp. Uh, I think it's, you know, constantly asking for new opportunities at Turner Sports and, you know, taking whatever they will give you and trying to make something out of it because – I mean, within that question is an assumption that, yes, I do the same thing every night. And there there is some truth to that. It, it becomes routine. So how do you make it different? How do you change it up? And, and I think, you know, 
outside of Turner Sports, I have to do different things. The NBL, for example, with Australia mm-hmm. is something different. So I try to grow that. Uh, you know, it was writing a book. That really was a challenge. It was a challenge that I never thought I would do in my life. Uh, but I broke it up in piecemeal and I got it done. And um, it was a thrill. It was a creative thrill. If nobody ever reads it, I did it. I absolutely did it. So um, it's Will you stuff do it like again? that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, but I, it, it's so hard, Sergio. I don't know. I don't know if you've written a book or not, but it's, it's a long commitment. It's, it's, you know, where I do a broadcast in a night and I'm done when I put it down, I'm done with a book. It was me going to Alaska, taking notes in advance of Alaska every day, everywhere I go, I'm taking notes, notes, notes. I'm interviewing people. And this is during a family trip, uh, several weeks. <laughs> sure they love that. Trip. Yeah. And exactly. Exactly. And you've got some scribe family member over there wandering around interviewing the park ranger. Uh, But in any case, I did that. And then you come home and it was eight months, nine months, 10 months until I finished it and then editing it. So, but the thing is, I feel like creatively it opened up some new avenues in my mind. So I think it's, it's stuff like that. Now I've got to take the chance and put it out there for the world to read. Yeah, That's the next step. Uh, but yeah, I, I, would I do it again? I would, but um, I, I think I need to, to wait a couple of years to give myself my mind a chance to wrap around another project I'd be really passionate about. I love travel logs. I love books about trips and journeys. So um, it would probably be another one in that vein. All right, what's your favorite book in the genre? Uh, probably The Innocence Abroad by Mark Twain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's safe to say he's America's greatest writer, even though like when you read him now, you're horrified at some of the things you read. Uh, his ability with, with the language is amazing. Um, Bill Bryson is sort of a modern day incarnation of him. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think The Innocence Abroad is maybe the classic book in that genre. I'll have to check them out. And I've, I've heard Bill Bryson's name a few times from different people, but have never, uh, never come across any of his books. But now that you've suggested it, I'll take a look. Well, yeah, he's he's a really witty writer who uh, moved to England and he lived in England for 20 years and traveled all around Europe. And in fact, uh, the most I just put down his book two or three days ago, uh, Neither Here Nor There, which is about a trip he took across Europe. Uh, And it was delightful and gave me some insights for my trip I'm about to take. Awesome. Back to the audience questions. Um, Has do you think digital and social media has made it easier or harder to get involved as a broadcaster? Um, it's made it different. <laughs> that's a that's a hedge, right? Uh, I think it's tougher to imagine being a TV broadcaster uh, in 2030, but I think it's there are just more jobs now uh, as a social broadcaster. Uh, we do so many shows socially now at Turner Sports that there are just more gigs out there. You know, we used to have, the, so here's, every night we have a crew sheet, right, at Turner Sports. So say it's a Thursday night at TNT. Well, the TNT crew is Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, Kenny Smith, and then the NBA TV will have a crew, and it's Matt Weiner, Brendan Haywood, Dennis Scott, whatever. Well, now there's a show called The bounce on Yahoo. And then there's a Twitter show and all of these are staffed with broadcasters too. Um, So I think there are more jobs. It's just not necessarily TV jobs. The other side of that too is I think, and one of the things I tried to impress upon the students at Sports Business Classroom was that I really, really think that now is the chance for you to go out and create a voice for yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no gatekeeper anymore. When When I got into the business, I had to impress a producer. I had to convince a producer that I could go on air and do the job for them. That's no longer the case. You can just go on air. We have several students from Sports Business Classroom that just put out their own podcast now, and they're getting better and better. And we have one student that has 30,000 followers. It's unbelievable. So, yeah, I I, I think that you just – you have opportunities now that you didn't have, but the big TV jobs may be fewer and farther between in the future. I totally agree. If you weren't in broadcasting, where would you want to be instead? 
Well, I think I, I've learned that. And well, two, two things I'll answer. Uh, one, maybe some job in Maui hanging out out there. But oh, yeah. really, in re- in reality, I think that Sports Business Classroom has taught me that I have a passion for impacting young people mm-hmm. uh, or people that just want to learn. I, you know, I keep saying young people. I, I, I think I need to really get in the habit of saying anybody that wants to learn and wants to grow. And, and you know, where I have expertise and where I can help, I want to help. So I think that was a rewarding experience. And, and you know, life changing is, is, is a very big thing to say, but it, in some ways it was because it makes you think, OK, this is something I can do successfully that I never really, as a five year old, had any grandiose quotes about doing. But I have an experience that that can help people. And that felt good. And I thought it was meaningful. So uh, that, that sort of meaningful help uh, is, is the stuff I'd like to be involved. I love it. How do you feel about the nickname, the Goatman Tater? And if you could, (laughs) what nickname would you give to yourself based off your career and current roles? Oh my God. The Goatman Tater. It's ridiculous. The nickname is ridiculous. Do you have a t shirt uh, that's like that says that? I should. I should be selling those t shirts. Or a tattoo, maybe? (laughs) I I really should. You know what's funny is it is now a joke my family uses against me. Oh, there goes the Goatman Tater again or whatever. So now now I it's it's a burden I wear. But look. I am beyond grateful that 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 nickname has become attached to me. Could have been worse. I, Could have been worse. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I deserve it. I'm not sure I'm worthy of it. But every day I work to be worthy of it. Um, and would I have given it to myself? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, really, I, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have ever even thought of that. Uh, the great. thing that happened was when when it, when it all went viral on Reddit. Uh, that's when everything blew up, and that's when the nickname came and now what's funny is if you go down to the office every producer has some sort of a goatman tater thing in their office uh and it's it's all ribbing me they're all taking shots at me yeah which is which is um you know it's it's in good fun but they're having more fun than i am i think on that uh but nonetheless it's i appreciate it and i i have no clue what my nickname would be if i gave it to myself but it wouldn't be as good as goatman tater plus i'm pretty sure you're not supposed to give yourself nicknames no, no. Yeah. Let somebody else do that. That's the idea. That's the better answer, Sergio. I appreciate it. There you go. Um, next question was, how much do you value consistency and creativity with what you do? And how do you balance both these characteristics within your career? Well, I'll give you a specific example with the top 10. Um, I, I work usually with one main producer every year and you get into a rhythm. So a consistency of quality and trustworthiness between uh, an announcer and a producer, I really value. I really, really, really value. And when a new producer comes in, it shakes things up. Now, in saying that, I think there's also a bit of value in having yourself shook up a little bit. It sure. makes it gets you out of your comfort zone, like we talked about. So, um, you know, if, if you look at last night's top ten, that was a different producer. So I had to adapt a little bit, uh, and you know, it's it's little things that people wouldn't even think about. I know when I have a main producer, it's going to be a play. The play is going to be about nine seconds long, and then a replay about six seconds long. So that's how long I'm going to talk on each play. Whereas if it's a new producer, he may put three or four replays in there. So I have to be ready to create more. He may jump around. The angles may be different. Uh, So I value consistency, especially when it comes to accuracy. I want people to be very accurate. I want to do at the, at the base of all my job and as silly as the rhyming is and everything. None of it works if I'm not accurate. Mm-hmm. None of it works if I'm not reliable. I have to be good at that base level to have this fun. So I value the consistency, but I do like to be shook up every once in a while and, and get some new blood in there. The key to staying sharp, right? A hundred percent. I mean, you know, you, you just you just get dull and you, you repeat yourself if you don't uh, if you don't get shook up. And I, I credit the NBL, the, the, those folks in Australia have really changed it up for me, too, because it's a different workflow that we have with the NBL than, than I have with the NBA. So I can approach it differently. Uh, and that's wonderful, too. It's just it's just all of that stuff keeps me fresh. And I do look, I did two top tens last night, one for Australia, one for America. 
America or for the NBA, whatever it is. Uh, and, and so I guess, you know, at some point, if you do too many of these, it gets stale. So I, I, I appreciate doing different things and I appreciate, um, you know, going through different producers and, get, and getting it mixed up a bit. This is a fantastic question. What is the most memorable moment in your career? One that makes the kid inside you go, wow. Okay, so that second part determines the story I'm going to tell you. Um, so when we moved from Mission Viejo, we went to North Carolina, and I became a humongous North Carolina basketball fan. And I know everybody in North Carolina, Michael Jordan's the guy, but for me, it was James Worthy. James Worthy was my hero. He is my childhood hero to this day. He is everything. And so while I was working with uh, TNT doing the feature producing, what happens in the playoffs is you get put on a crew for a series. Well, James Worthy was one of our announcers. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, it, I had worked in the business for four or five years at this point. So I was used to meeting people that were famous and were successful basketball players. But meeting James Worthy was definitely different uh, for me. I was so excited. But in the thing is, there's this duality in your mind of, OK, totally be professional. Don't right. act like anything's different. But also, oh, my gosh, this is James Worthy. I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm seeing this. So uh, there was a moment we were in San Antonio at a restaurant, and he and I are talking, and we're like, Let, yeah, let's go just do this after dinner. And we're hanging out, and me and, me and James Worthy are hanging out. And it, in the moment, I'm just like, I'm just hanging out with a guy. But there was a point I, I vividly remember saying to myself, Bo, you are hanging out with James Worthy, right? And I and I, I was I was 12 years old all over again. Uh, for 10 seconds, I composed myself. I got myself together, but it was just it was just one of those one of those life experiences that I'll I'll never forget. It was it was the best thing ever. Uh, you know, I haven't worked with him since. It's been 15 years, something like that. But that moment, I'll I'll, I'll cherish forever. Well, good for you. I mean, again, four-year-old boy achieving his dream, hanging out with one of his childhood heroes. That's fantastic. Yeah, he was the absolute guy. I have a picture. It's like a grainy picture we took of him and I, but uh, I, I have it to this day. And, and he was and remains the absolute idol of mine. So it was a thrill. I love that. So we're, we're running out of time. So I want to ask a few rapid fire questions if you're up for it. All right. Yeah. They don't need to be rapid fire answers, but uh, <laughs> let's see where this goes. Okay. So what, what's one piece of advice you've received in your career that you'd want to pass along to this next wave of talent? Be true to yourself. Uh, the best mentor I've ever had was Ernie Johnson. He has been kinder and more generous with his time to me as I've grown as a broadcaster than than he ever needed to be. Uh, but, you know, as you're developing as a broadcaster, at some point you'll figure out that it's you out there and you got to get comfortable in your skin. And he told me, be true to yourself, be who you are out there. And, uh, it's invaluable advice. And I think, you know, wherever you are in whatever job you're in, I think, I think it applies. You have any advice as far as how to put that into practice? Um, yeah, get comfortable with saying things how you, as, a, as far as broadcasting goes, I put everything in my own words now. People will provide me scripts. I rewrite it and put everything in my own uh, words uh, so that I'm comfortable. It's mm -hmm. me up there. Uh, so it, it, that goes back to my feel for writing. But I think that, that that's true with everything. And I, I think it, it, it even, Sergio, it gets down to who you are as a person, your ethics, your values, and everything like that. Um there are jobs, I'm sure, tough jobs out there where you feel like you're compromising so, so much, but at some root level, you got to be true to yourself. I love that. That's a great answer. Thank you, Bo. H have you ever had a major screw up or failure? And if so, what did you learn from it? Oh, yeah. I've had several. Uh, <laughs> too many to list. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you a couple. Uh, the first time I was ever on live television, I was on national television hosting the Braves. I got that job out of a local high school show that I was doing, and I went on an audition at Turner Sports, and obviously I knew the people, but I legitimately earned that job. Uh, I had never had the countdown in my ear before. I had never uh, <laughs> dealt with the pressure of live before. You could always screw up when you're just taping stand-ups. I'd never had the pressure of live before. Now, I got through 
the first day or two okay. But then, you know, inevitably, you're going to screw up. And I, I think what happens is it was speeding up. It's, it's like when you hear a basketball player, the game's so fast right now and you need it to slow down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I really, I, I remember apologizing on air. Uh, I'm sorry for that. It was supposed to be this player or whatever. And if you're watching the broadcast at home, it probably looks like no big deal. But for me in that moment, it was a huge deal. Um, so I, I think the other thing that I would say to people uh, that I didn't have the confidence to do that I wish I did that I think people that are going to be put in my position in the future need to have. You need to have the confidence in yourself to say, this is what I need to do my job well. Um, I was very much, when I got the job, over the moon grateful and would would jump through any hoop technically or in, or, or otherwise uh, when it was to my detriment. Uh, if, if you're not hearing something right in your ear, tell them. There are professionals there that will get it right. You don't have to fight through it. So uh, you know, I think I think that's a lesson I learned, uh, and it came through screw ups. Um, the other thing is, I I say thousands, maybe millions of words on air a year. Uh, you're going to screw some up. You have to almost be like a defensive back. You have to have a short memory. You mm-hmm. don't want to forget it. You don't want to diminish the mistake, but you, you certainly don't uh, want to let it impact your performance going forward. So that would be other advice. Get over it, make amends, however you can with yourself and then do your best going forward. You can't be thinking about the mistake from two minutes ago if you're still in a broadcast. So true. So true. Well, Bo, thank you so much for your time. Uh, You know, I I know you're super busy. NBA.com top 10 is one of my favorite pieces of daily (laughs) content. And honestly, to get the opportunity to chat with you like this, Truly, truly an honor. Really appreciate your time. Hope we can do this again soon. Um, Do you want to tell people where they can find you online? Yeah, I am uh, at NBA Bo. That's NBA B E A U uh, on Twitter. You can find my stuff uh, on YouTube. You can find my uh, NBL top tens at at NBL dot com or just at NBL on Twitter, I guess. Uh, so yeah, you can find my stuff all over the place like that. Uh, and once again, thanks to you, Sergio, for doing this. It's always a pleasure talking to you. We get to talk to each other off the air uh, so often for the past couple. Of years but but this has been a real pleasure and i hope uh that that you keep having this success going forward with this project because i think it adds a lot of value for people who are wanting to grow in their careers whatever it may be thanks bo appreciate you saying that and uh i appreciate you thank you take care there you have it, my friends i hope you enjoyed this interview with the gomentator bo essies if you did please make sure to share this with your friends Post it on social media and subscribe and leave us a review. You can find the show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Bo dash Estes. That's B-E-A-U dash E-S-T-E-S. If you listen and enjoyed the podcast, we'd really love to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts and any follow-up questions you may have by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom and at NBA Bo. Big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media, and thanks again for listening. We will see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.